Hey everyone, hope you're well, thanks for joining me. Now today I wanted to go over the stock market, how it works, how you can get involved and how you can make money. Hey guys, thanks for joining me, my name's Ben. So we're gonna go over stock market investing, but possibly a good place to start would be what is investing. If that's the case, it means you've probably missed one of my last videos, so feel free to go back and check that out. Now, in stock market investing, there is a lot of mumbo jumbo that goes around covering over the important bits, but today we're gonna to break all that down, we're gonna go through everything you need to know, and hopefully by the end of this video, you will be in a position to be investing for yourself. Right, so assuming that you've watched every other video that I've ever made, which thank you very much for doing so, we can understand that you know what investing is and how to proceed. So what would now be worth looking at is my difference between trading and investing. For me, the main difference that I see between traders and investors are investors are in for the long run. They'll buy a share, they'll hold it for years and years, up to 10, 20, 30 years, and they'll recoup value through that slowly. Whereas traders wanna get in and get out, so they want to go in, buy a share low, sell it high, potentially only staying in that share for up to a day, maybe overnight. There is a phrase that you'll hear that is time in the market beats timing the market and I feel that traders are more so timing the market than having time in the market, which is what investors are doing. So for a trader, they'd be looking to buy low and sell high. They would essentially be trying to time the market and get the best response that they can. Whereas an investor is in for the long haul, they'll pick up a share and they'll hold it for a long period of time, reclaiming any dividends that it may pay out or potentially trimming their position as it grows in time. But now you may be asking, Ben, that's all well and good. But what do I do? What is a share? And that's a very good question, imaginary person, that I've just made up to segue into this next section. So a share is just a portion of a company. It's a piece of the company that you can buy that attributes your value and your percentage of ownership. A lot of people, when they buy shares, they just look at numbers on a sheet, they see values going up and down. But one important thing to remember is that you are buying a part of a business rather than just a name or a number. So to potentially simplify it, let's imagine that we had a company with 100 shares and then that company was selling shares for £10 a pop. If you took your £10 and bought a share of that company, you would own one hundredth of the company. Now, this doesn't mean that you can walk into any shop that you own shares in, boss them around, do whatever you want because you're an owner. You don't own that much, but you do own a portion of it. So going back to my past example is if you bought one share for £10 and you had 1% of the company and the company decided to release money to their shareholders in the form of a dividend, you would get 1% of the total payout. Therefore, if the company paid out a hundred pounds worth of dividends to all of their shareholders, you would get one pound back for your one pound ownership of the company, reflecting your percentage of what they have made and profited from. The other thing that can happen is that if you've bought a share for 10 pound and you own 1% of the company and the company does really well and increases, as with any shareholder or owner of the company, you would see a benefit from that your share price could increase from £10 a share up to £20 a share. In that situation, what you've essentially done is doubled your money because the overall value of the company has increased, which has increased your percentage value of that company as well. So you've doubled your money through holding that company's share. Adversely, the company could have terrible issues, terrible things could happen to the company, and your £10 could then be reduced down in value to, say, £5, in which case you've lost half of your money. It's worth remembering that while your value may go up and down, depending on how your company is doing, if they're doing well, it will increase, and when they're doing poorly, it may decrease. Unless you sell, you haven't realised any of these losses, and therefore you haven't lost money until you press that sell button and equally you haven't gained money until you press that sell button. So it's worth also pointing out that shares aren't the only thing you can buy in the stock market. You do also have access to bonds. What bonds are is essentially you lending money to a government or a corporate entity. Essentially what happens here is you buy a bond that will give you an estimated return and that will pay back a set amount of interest per year or per period and then you can see various different types on trading brokers as to whether it's a corporate or a government bond. Bond values do tend to get affected by the varying levels of interest that change throughout the time. So as one goes up, the other will decrease and vice versa. And you'll often hear of portfolios of much older retired people using bonds as a more stable form of consistent income as opposed to relying on actual companies that may fluctuate through time to time. You also have ETFs, which is an exchange traded fund. And essentially this is a pre-built portfolio that you can buy into and then you gain the benefits of all of the companies in that ETF. Now, an ETF is very useful for instant diversification because rather than buying one company or one share of a company, you are buying a percentage of multiple companies, therefore reducing your overall risk because you're not relying on one company to do well. Yes, calm down, I can hear you, diversification. So the easiest and most layman way to break down diversification is the old saying, never put all your eggs in one basket. 
What's this? Why is that? Why should I bother doing that? You may be asking those questions, but the reason for this is most people do it to reduce risk without reducing too much reward. In the stock market, it is always a balance of risk versus reward, and you want to find the one you're most comfortable with. So for an example, let's get hypothetical. Let's start off and say you had two companies. You had company A, which is a bottling plant, and you have company B, which is a bottling plant. Let's imagine that both of these companies solely put fizzy drinks into plastic bottles and that is their only requirement and that is all they do. Now you've got your first 100 pound and you have the option to buy either of these companies. You've got company A or you've got company B. You prefer company A. The bottles that they tend to put out are the bottles that you're buying and you see on your shelf and you have a strong confidence with that company. So you go out and buy 100 pounds worth of company A. That 100 pound, was in total two shares of the company. So you're happy, you've bought your two shares for 50 pound each, you're sitting away, you see more of these bottles of fizzy drink coming out and coming out and more kids are losing their teeth and losing their teeth. Because of this and all the great business going on, the company's share price has increased. And what you originally bought for 50 pound is now worth 200 pound. So in total, your value has gone up to 400 pound. Now that's all well and good and you've netted 300 pound in profit, but you haven't sold your shares yet because you think it's going to carry on and you don't want to get off this horse yet. And then suddenly the newspapers realize that all these kids that are losing their teeth is a bad thing. And the newspapers kick up in arms and blame company A for the poor drinks that they've been delivering and the share price drops. You log on to your broker the following day and what you see is that the share price has dropped all the way from £200 a share down to £5 a share. You didn't sell, you knew they were gonna carry on, but now it seems that you've lost 45 pound a share. This 45 pound is only based on what you've actually put in. If you equate the fact that they were over 200 pound a share, you've lost a lot more. While it's worth pointing out that this is a hypothetical situation and no kids have actually lost their teeth in the making of this episode, it is worth pointing out that this is a true risk of investing. However, there are ways to mitigate this, and yes, diversification is one of those ways. Now, let's imagine the exact same situation. Except instead of buying £100 worth of company A, you bought £50 worth of company A and £50 worth of company B. And what we'll assume is that company B didn't do as amazing as company A and didn't do as poorly as company A. They just on average did a little bit better. So while you're watching company A shoot up to £400 a share, you look and company B has only increased from £50 to £60 a share. So from that point of view, you're happy. You've not made as much money as if you went with company A, but you're still overall making money. So let's again imagine that company A has a deep drop which falls all the way down to £5 a share but company B has still managed to increase by another £10 in share price. Now you're looking and you've lost £45 on company A because you've got one share and it's dropped to £5 but your second share that you bought in company B has actually increased by £20 so you're only down £25. What this has done is reduced your loss and obviously as you imagine that the more that company B does well the higher that price goes and it would counteract your loss from company A and that's one of the benefits of diversification but it's also worth going slightly further with this and remembering that while you can diversify across companies you can also diversify across sectors. So let's go back to the previous example where we were looking at you bought one share of each company. The issue is both of these are bottling plants. If for any reason plastic was forbidden and no one could ever produce fizzy drinks both of your companies would drop in value which is why most people tend to diversify across sectors so you would buy one in the fizzy drink section and then potentially one in another section such as automotive or energy so that's diversification and the benefits what you're doing is you're reducing the amount of risk you take while trying to increase the amount of reward you buy multiple companies so that what happens is if one starts to fail the other successful ones will pick up the slack and you just hope that you don't pick an entire portfolio of failures so now we understand diversification you can see how an etf is good for that by buying into an etf you're buying into a large selection of companies in a pre-built portfolio Therefore, you're getting instant diversification with every purchase. So now we know what it's a bond, we know what's an ETF, and we know what's a share. It's worth touching briefly on different investing styles. Generally, we have active investing and passive investing. The main difference here is the amount of work or input each investor wants to use, hence active or passive. Personally, for me, I'm quite an active investor. I go through every single company that I own and look at their spend, look at their monthly reports and look at their financials. I also have a spreadsheet that I put every single purchase and sale and every dividend that I've ever made. And it also tracks every ex-dividend date so that I can budget appropriately and see what is coming into value at what time. Where a passive investor would rather have less input, they'd rather pull back on the reins a little bit, put the money into the account and just let it grow and put it in and let it grow on a consistent basis without all of the work. 
For passive investors, ETFs are a good option because you're getting instant diversification and they do follow an index which is a pre-built collection of companies such as the top 500 companies in the US. Therefore, if you know that the world is not going to be burning and that there's gonna be no government and no finance and no economy in the next 10, 20, 30 years, you can just put 10 pound, 100 pound, 1,000 pound, however much you want a month into these investments and just keep growing. For example, you could pick up two different ETFs. You could pick up the dividend high growth or the S&P 500 or FTSE 250, and then just put monthly into this, watch it slowly grow over time, consistently adding money. Generally, if you're investing in ETFs over a long period of time, you're not going to lose money. Obviously, that's not a guarantee, but over a period of 10 years, very few indexes have ever made a loss over a 10 year period. Alternatively, for active investors, these are investors that will also invest in ETFs, but generally more so look at individual stocks such as me. I go through and rather than investing into a pre-built ETF, I will go and pick my own companies and I will manage them myself similar to an ETF would be managing. The downside here is I do a lot of work to go through and keep up to date on all of the companies that I'm doing that some people may not want to but it does give me more of a selective input on what I'm investing my money into and how I can get my returns. So for example, my strategy is to invest in dividend paying stocks and a few growth stocks based on the COVID recovery. The main reason for this is I feel that the best companies are ones that do return value to their shareholders without me having to sell any of the company. But we'll cover all that in a future episode because if I go over all my strategies and everything that I'm planning to do in the future, it is going to take three hours. So I'll be bringing them out as future videos for you to watch and enjoy. If there's anything you want me to touch on, obviously let me know in the comments below. Now, I can't make a video about investing in the stock market and what's going on without mentioning one person, Warren Buffett. Who is Warren Buffett, you ask? This is Warren Buffett. Warren Buffett started out in the good old days when everything was in black and white and everything was simpler. When he was younger, he took his life savings and put it into the stock market and bought shares. He then bought more and more and eventually bought all of the shares for a company called Berkshire Hathaway. Berkshire Hathaway was converted into an investment company that is led by Warren Buffett and has seen him to be one of the top 10 richest men in the world in the past. I believe he was edging between Bill Gates around the level eight at one point recently. But one of the main reasons that I wanted to bring up Warren Buffett is he is an icon around investors. There's loads of things that he says that people cling on to, but there are a couple of things that I personally like as well. First off is his two rules. The first rule on investment is don't lose. And the second rule on investment is don't forget the first rule. And that's all the rules there are. Now there's so much to Warren Buffett that I wouldn't be able to fit it into a single section of here. I may be doing a future video on him as a person in general. However, there are also videos on YouTube that you can find out more about him. Now calm down, I get you, I hear you. I understand what you're saying. You're saying, Ben, I understand not to lose money, but the question is, how do I not lose money? Well, to answer that question, I've got a small snippet from a previous interview with Warren Buffett here for you, and we'll see what he has to say for himself. So I would pick a broad index, but I wouldn't toss a chunk in at any one time. I would do it over a period of time because the, the very nature of index funds is that you are saying, I think America's business is going to do well over a reasonably well over a long period of time. However, if you wanted to be a bit of a contrarian and you wanted to pick your own stocks, there are a few things that will help you. There are different types of analysis that you can look out for. The first one being fundamental analysis. Fundamental analysis is looking at the actual company's data in the sense of what the company's doing, how they're making their money, how much money they've got on hand, their value to book ratio, and there's also multiple equations you can do to work out what they call intrinsic value. The idea here is that you'd use this analysis to work out the future value of the company and then refer that back to you, the present day value based on the amount of return you would like to make. I will be looking to do videos on different types of analysis that you can use. So if you're interested in that, remember to smash the like button, click the subscribe button and ring the tiny bell. The other type of analysis is what is referred to as technical analysis. And this is more so what you'll hear day traders using. And this is watching the actual stock on the stock market, how the ticker changes, the price, the value, it going up and down, noticing patterns and seeing that when it's likely to hit this point, it's gonna rebound and skyrocket. The idea here is you'd buy at the low, sell at the high, you've made your money. I see technical analysis more as playing the game and reading the people and the mindset rather than looking at a company and knowing if you've got a good company. Technical analysis could advise you to buy into a company that is failing miserably just because it's likely to have a small rebound for you to be able to capture some profit. Right, so let's go over this. We know that the different types of investments, we know that we need to not lose money, 
and we know that there's ways to work out the true value or believed true value of a company. But beyond that, the one thing that is worth also mentioning is the mindset that you need to have as an investor. This mindset isn't too hard to understand, but it's very hard to follow through. It's very hard to gain and to actually utilize in person. And what that is, is to not sell when everyone is telling you to sell. Only sell when you know it is the right choice. Equally to that, you shouldn't be buying anything unless you know you're going to be holding it. What you wanna look at is to buy when people are fearful and sell when people are greedy. That is the general saying that is thrown around the internet. Now, why I'm talking about this is there are lots of times where people will buy a company just because they know roughly what it does, they like the sound of it, they've bought the products before, and then they have no attachment to that stock. So when the price goes up, they're really happy, they're elated. However, when the price goes down, they panic, and because they don't want to lose money, they sell. What you have to remember is that until you sell, you haven't lost money. And as long as you know that the company that you're buying into is going to survive and do well, in theory, it should bounce back to where it was before and potentially grow. A lot of people will buy shares. As soon as it drops, they panic, they sell, and they've lost money. They then see that it starts going up. They buy back into the same shares they've just sold at a higher price than they bought before. This is just lunacy. Just don't do this. What I would suggest is if you're gonna buy individual companies, go find companies you know, look at their finances, make sure they'll survive, research them properly, buy and hold. Therefore, if your company that you've bought at 10 pound drops to five pound, you know that it is nothing to worry about. More so, it's like going to the shop and seeing buy one, get one free on your shares. So you might as well buy some more if you've got the money and you're still confident in the company. Partially, I feel this is brought on by the actual brokers themselves. They have a habit of putting obviously negative numbers in red and positive numbers in green which trains your brain to see that the positives is good and the negatives is bad, which they are, but from a further investment point of view, you would actually rather your things to be cheaper until you're planning to sell them because you'd rather buy more. Now, it's important to remember with that mindset that just because something's dropping doesn't mean to sell it. However, there could be a reason that you should. You should always keep apprised of news from your companies and information around them. By doing that, you'll know if there's something that's actually detrimental to your company. If there's something that's happened that you believe your company will not survive, that is a good time to sell your shares. We could equate this similar to a house. So let's say you bought a house for £100,000 and then three days later you find out your house is only worth £50,000 because there's been a depreciation in the market. Do you go out at that moment and sell your house for half the money because you're worried about the fact that you've lost money? No, of course you don't. You still have a house. So it's important to remember this the similar way in stocks. You own a part of a business. You don't own numbers on a sheet. So let's go over our tick list. We know what we can buy in the sense of bonds, ETFs and shares. We know that there are ways of valuing them, which we can look into separately. We know never to lose money. And we also know who Warren Buffett is and the right mindset for investing. But there's one thing we still don't know. How do you buy a share? How do you do it all? How do you go out and get a part of a company? Now, buying a share. So this is probably one of the easiest sections to go over. But essentially, what you need to buy a share is a broker. So what's a broker? A broker is an entity that is entirely built to facilitate your trading. Whether this is a company like Trading212 or Fair Trade here in the UK or Robinhood in America, they are entirely there just to facilitate you to go and buy shares from companies. When you're looking to buy a share, you would register that with your trader and let them know. They would go out and execute it and then apply the trade to your account and you would end up with the final share at a rough price of which you agreed to pay. Now, there are many different types of brokers out there. You've got what I call new age brokers and old school brokers. New age brokers are more of these fintech companies such as Trading212, which are entirely there to make it as open as possible for everyone to invest in. They offer a very easy mobile platform with little to no trading fees or commissions. Then you've got some more of the old school ones, which is more like Hargreaves, Lansdowne and trading companies like that. What you would do with them is the exact same thing, but they tend to have higher limits, making it that you have to buy whole shares and also pay commissions on their shares. There are pros and disadvantages to this. The advantage of paying higher commissions to your shares is that you will generally think more about what you're buying and potentially buy in larger sections. 
However, the disadvantage is you're paying money you don't have to pay. With new age companies like Trading212 that I use, you don't pay any commission fees. The most you'll pay is potentially a transfer fee on your card. The idea of this is it essentially democratizes investing and it makes it open for multiple people because you can invest from as little as a pound. To find a broker, it's really easy. You can essentially Google it, you can go on the App Store, or if you wanted to use Trading212, we've got the link below. One thing that I would remind you when you're looking at a new broker is to check if they are FCSC insured. Essentially, what this means is that your account is covered up to £85,000 worth of loss. This isn't loss in the sense of you've bought a company and the company's failed. This is loss in the sense of trading 212 as an entity has gone bust and you had £60,000 in the account with them. I will be going through various different trading platforms showing you how to set up in future and how to get going on all of these accounts, mainly starting with Trading212, Free Trade, and eToro, so that if you wanna keep an eye out for them, make sure you click the subscribe button. Now, you've got the information, you have the power. So go out, find a broker, and if you want to, buy a share. If you do, it'd be great if you could pop back, drop down in the comments, let us know what you've bought. Let's get a community going and let's get people talking down below. And as always, thank you for joining me and have a great rest of the week.